Our journey starts as most journeys do, by getting gas. Most people don't show this part, but it's important for us to establish a level of trust here. No green screens. This is a real car. And this real car is taking me from the middle of nowhere Kagoshima to a place called Izumi, which is famous for its tens of thousands of cranes that fly through every year from Siberia. I saw a total of zero cranes. I'm heading to the island of Amakusa to learn more about Japan's hidden Christians, eat some noodles, and look at a lewd rock, but also stumble across the scariest thing that I've seen since the Game Boy camera. Once I made it to Izumi, I decided to swing by a 7-Eleven, because this wouldn't be a full-length video without a 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven is great in Japan, thanks to its plethora of healthy and not-so-healthy choices. They even have daily life stuff like batteries, shampoo, and a PS2 soft mod kit and they're placed all over the country. It's like Dollar General if they complete their quest of world domination. There's something here for everyone in every mood, and almost all of it is absolutely delicious. With so many great choices, I wonder what I'll get. I got a water. Seriously? People have been waiting six months for this video and this is what you do? Fully hydrated, I climbed back into my real car and turned on the Bomberman Hero soundtrack and headed toward Nagashima Island. I know I'm not making very much sense, so here's a map that I paid somebody on Fiverr to make for me. Finally, we approach the Kuronoseto Bridge, which connects where I am to Nagashima Island. Nagashima Island is where I'll board a ferry to get to another island. Let me take a second to be completely serious here. Japan is beautiful. Everything from the water to the mountains to the drunk sleeping guy outside of the Jankara with his head in his own toriki is beautiful. If I didn't have a ferry to catch, I'd probably go looking for Triforce pieces in this beautiful Eiffel 65 water. But I have a boat to catch. So I arrived at the ferry ring that would take me to Amakusa. Don't worry, we're almost there. But before I took off, I had some time to admire nature again. There is truly therapy in nature. In fact, Ralph Emerson once said, In the presence of nature, a wild delight runs through the man, in spite of real sorrows. And Woody once said, There's a snake in my boot. I boarded the boat with my car. Let's enjoy some car entering a boat ASMR. There's no way anyone on YouTube has ever uploaded this, so I'm excited to make history. Okay, enough of that. No one's laughing. I walked around the deck to say goodbye to land. Who knows the next time that I'll see solid ground. It could be months. The arduous journey ahead actually has me pretty worried, but I'll never take my land life for granted again. I went in the butt to discover a lounge area that looks like a mix between a hospital and a Chili's, and they had a little boat bodega, so I got some Ritz crackers, and I set off on my journey. This boat will finally take me to Amaksa Island, most known but not so known because no one ever seems to talk about it as a hiding place for Japan's hidden Christians during the Edo period. It's a World Heritage Site, but that doesn't really mean anything because nine-tenths of Japan is a World Heritage Site. This boat that I'm on right now is probably a World Heritage Site, and so is all this water and these buildings and this mountain. Everything's a World Heritage Site, I'm not kidding. We'll talk more about history once I get some food in my stomach, so get ready for a nice little history lesson. Finally, it was time to disembark. I tried to get into a Ferrari instead of my real car, but it didn't really work out too well and I was immediately arrested. Luckily, I've played the second bunker mission on GoldenEye, so I knew what to do. To celebrate my release from prison, let's go to the beach. You can't go to an island without seeing the beach. Why else would anyone even make an island, other than the obvious of protecting yourself from dinosaurs when they escape from a lab in Vermont? This is Mogushi Beach. A famous beach famous for sand and water. It was a great little place for me to just go and relax and clear my head before I set off on my journey all around the island. And it's a great place for Windows desktop pictures. The sand here is extremely coarse and it's a darker color. Starving? I ate a little bit and it wasn't that good. But what do you want from me? It's been like four minutes and I haven't had a single bite to eat. The water here is crystal clear, so I took a short bath. But honestly, I can't focus on anything. I need food right now. It was time for me to finally try one of Amaksa's two famous foods. I arrived at a quaint little beachside cafe with heavy Hawaiian vibes, but I'm not sure why. Either way, it was time to taste the legendary Amaksa champon. Don't worry, I didn't just call you a bad word. Champon is kind of a sort of ramen that originated in Nagasaki. But Nagasaki champon is made with a soup using chicken and pork bones, while Amaksa's version is made with a soy sauce base. At first glance, this is ramen, but it's actually not a very nice thing to say. Everything from the noodles to the toppings are completely different, so next time you see somebody online calling champon ramen, be sure to correct them so that our friend champon gets the credit he deserves. This is just about the perfect meal. Not only is the champon delicious, but the seaside views are impeccable. The broth is super light, and it basically has a 1 to 1 ratio of veggies to noodles. I guess this is a good food to eat while you're on a diet. There's a wonderful variety in champon as well. This thing is topped with every single ingredient in the world. Shrimp, fish cakes, pork, squid, clams, hokusai, carrots, seaweed. It's like they just stuck their hand out in the ocean and grabbed whatever came up. And I love it. But the best part about a maksa champon is that you don't feel gross after eating it. When I was done, I was excited to see the new world around me. With a belly full of champon, I decided to walk around the deck of the cafe and explore this paradise. I stood up on the railing and started my monologue. In a world covered by endless water. But an immigration officer pulled me down immediately and said deportation or mystery stairs. I took the mystery stairs because I was planning on going down here anyways. The stairs were so long that I wasn't sure where I would end up. But I just kept following them like 7 year old me trying to catch up to the Bowser painting in Super Mario 64. Halfway down the stairs I looked around and continued my monologue before being busted and escorted back up the stairs. This time I was told that I could avoid jail time if I just went to the church. I was planning on going to the church anyway, so I said sure, but I haven't started my historical summary of hidden Christians in Amaksa yet, and I refused to go without reading the script that I spent hours on. The police officer agreed to let me read my script, so let's have fun with history while you enjoy a little montage of all the driving I did on this trip. I'm about to be heading to the more central part of the island, to a place called Sakitsu Village. 
a small fishing village that nearly had its entire population converted to Catholicism when a Portuguese missionary came over in 1569. Christianity was formally introduced to Japan in 1549, but its controversy didn't sit well with the Japanese shogunate for long, and thus it was banned for most of the Edo period. Well, that's a little bit oversimplified. The big man at the time, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, at first didn't mind Christianity. But then he changed his mind while he was on a business trip, and he came to believe that Christian missionaries were selling Japanese people as slaves overseas, as well as destroying shrines and temples and forcing people to convert. Most people believe that Hideyoshi thought that the Christian's true goals was to convert everyone, overthrow the shogunate, and colonize Japan. I'm not going to say that his fears were rational or irrational, but yeah. Over the next couple of decades, the shogunate would eradicate Christianity via public crucifixion, laws, and just all around not great stuff. There was even a rebellion, the largest in Japan's history, that also has ties to this place, but we'll talk about that later. Practicing Christianity in any way would be met with the punishment of death, which really sucks if you want to be alive. So how do you practice your faith covertly? Well, the people of Amakusa would do several things, such as praying to images of Mary that would be found inside of abalone shells. They would often worship in secret rooms and create statues of the Virgin Mary that were made to look like Kanon, the Buddhist goddess of mercy, which is one of the most common Buddhist figures in Japan. If you look carefully, the Christian constructed Maria Kanon is typically depicted holding a baby. I'm sure you can guess who the baby is. It wasn't uncommon for Kanon to be associated with babies, so this method was actually pretty genius. But to the hidden Christians, this was a way for them to secretly practice their faith. This church was originally constructed in 1888 after the ban of Christianity was lifted. I may have made it sound like it was some quick thing that blew over, but it's worth noting that Christianity was banned from 1614 all the way until 1873. So that's a long time. But it was moved in 1934. The altar sits at the site of the Fumie, which is a place where suspected Christians would be asked to step on a plaque with Christian imagery on it, such as a crucifix or the Virgin Mary. If anyone showed hesitance, they were pretty much immediately dealt with. I couldn't film the inside, but there's plenty of pictures online. And fun fact, this might be the only church in the world with tatami mat flooring. That was a really long time without a joke, so let's go to look at an opai rock. If you know Japanese or have a taste for saucy culture, you may have just done a virtual double take. But nope, you heard me right. This is opaiwa, more succinctly translated in English to boob rock. I intentionally avoided all pictures of this place so I could admire it as the spectacle it is. I followed the gates and sure enough, yep, that's a boob. Why isn't this a World Heritage Site? It definitely should be. Let it be known that this is the most crowded location I went to in this entire trip. It seems like the general public is less interested in church and more interested in a rock. But it's like Ralph Emerson once said, wow that's a big booba. I wasn't really sure what to do so I just looked at it and I headed to my next destination. But on the way I stepped in a puddle so I had to dry my sock off like a caveman with a car. Although slightly titillated, I had to go buy some gifts for my friends. So I headed into a dolphin center for some gifts. And no, that's not a GameCube reference. Even though we are in the middle of the ocean, we're still in Kumamoto Prefecture, as you can see by Kumamo. Danganronpa kind of made me not enjoy bears anymore, so let's just move on. There's all sorts of cool stuff to get at rest areas like this, and they can be found pretty much all over Japan. They often feature local treats, which is perfect for people like me who have been neglecting buying anything this whole trip. Just as I was about to buy something for someone and be nice, I found ice cream, and that takes precedence. This is vanilla sea salt ice cream that uses real sea salt from the real Amaksa Ocean. And that real ocean has real dolphins in it. And they even offer a dolphin tour here where you can get your money back if you don't see any dolphins. This is the best soft serve I've ever had. The creamy soft notes of vanilla collide beautifully with the sharp jabs of salt. This made the whole trip worth it. I'm just frustrated because the best ice cream I've ever had is on an island three light years away. But maybe that'll prevent me from eating it too often. Now let's go to a temple, which, you guessed it, is related to the history of the hidden Christians in Amaksa. Quiz time. Do you know what the difference between temples and shrines are in Japan? Of course you do. You probably just said it to yourself right now. Some of the more vocal members of the community are shouting it, and others are making snarky comments in the comment section. If you guess that one starts with a T and the other starts with an S, you're right, good job. This temple was constructed with the sole purpose of converting Christians into the Buddhist religious tradition, after that major uprising that I'm going to talk about later. Next time you're at a temple, go look for these scary statues at the entrance. This is Agyo and Ungyo. The guy with the open mouth, Agyo, represents birth and beginnings, while the closed mouth, Ungyo, represents death and endings. They were made to fend off evil spirits and are intentionally creepy. I think warding off thieves probably had something to do with their appearance, though. There's almost no one at these temples, and I kind of love that, except at night because it's scary and it makes me cry. For all the senseless stuff that I know thanks to 4AM YouTube deep dives, you'd think I know more about the individual aspects of temples, but I don't. But I can tell you why the YM2612 is better than the SPC700, though. Why do I seem to only be interested in things people don't care about? Let's go to a shrine now. Wait, how did I get here? Oh yeah, it's literally right beside the temple. While the temple was there to convert folks to Buddhism, I guess the shrine was built beside that to convert people to Shinto. This place is literally a religion golden corral. Oh, and guess who came to play? The Christians built a massive museum beside all of it. This is getting to be too much. This is Amaksa Shiro, basically the most important person to Amaksa's Christians other than Jesus. He was the leader of the Shimabara Rebellion, a huge uprising of Japanese Roman Catholics against the Shogunate in 1637. He was 17 years old, and I don't know what you guys were doing when you were 17, but I definitely wasn't leading a rebellion. I personally was watching hard jump and jump style tutorials on YouTube. The Christian rebels had some early success and even took over Hara Castle, but as you could expect, it didn't end well. Amaksa Shiro had to raise morale, so what did he do? He hung up posters around the castle that said, Now those who accompany me in being besieged in this castle will be my friends into the next world. 
That sounds nice until you think about it and realize that it's basically saying we're all about to die. Long story short, the Shogunate army with the help of the Protestant Dutch stormed with over 125,000 troops, and they killed nearly 40,000 Christian soldiers and sympathizers. Amak Sashiro was taken into custody and publicly beheaded. His head was displayed on a pike for a long time in Nagasaki as a warning that Christianity would not be tolerated. He was only 17 years old when he was killed. This museum is an awesome place to see artifacts from that time. I couldn't film in there, but they have Amak Sashiro's banner that was used in the rebellion, as well as a bunch of other stuff like Maria Kanon's and the Fumier plaques. I highly recommend visiting it. Can we eat now? Yes we can. This is Toraya, a super fresh seafood market slash restaurant that I was really excited to try, but they were closed for some reason and I have no idea why. So I went to a different place called Yamamoto instead. It's still a fresh fish place, so I guess it'll do. This place was filled with all sorts of fish that I have no idea the names of. I tried to scoop one up in a bottle, but it didn't work. The inside is beautiful and well laid out. There's even counter seating where you can look at the fish as you eat fish, but that's a little sadistic even for me. This menu has more items on it than Donkey Kong 64, and instead of debating endlessly like I do in the supermarket, I just grabbed a seafood bowl with all sorts of stuff in it. This may look pretty good, but honestly it was just okay. There was a little amount of fish for the price, and the fish wasn't exactly spectacular. I would consider this normal, but I wouldn't really expect normal on an island. I left there feeling like I ate a bowl of rice, and that's pretty much it. Maybe my expectations were just too high, like how my expectations are always too high for everything ever. I've had way better for way less in places that are way harder to get fresh fish. Maybe this place emphasizes so much on fresh fish that the preparation leaves a bit to be desired. I know it's just raw fish, but it's funny how something as simple as the way you cut a piece of meat can impact the entire experience. This actually makes me pretty sad because I was looking forward to a really high quality bowl of fish. I want to be clear that it's not bad. It's just, I don't, I don't know. It's just, I, I, I have no idea. It's not good. It's almost time to catch my ferry back home, but I had to stop by one last place, a place that I remember for a very long time. I saw a bunch of flags by the road and I knew I had to stop here. I thought it was just going to be a normal rest area, but what I saw will confuse me for the rest of my life. Don't be scared. We'll go in together. Number seven, Japan's hidden scarecrow village. This place was incredibly eerie. I was walking around, even though an anonymous redditor told me to stay away. This is the Kakashi no Sato, or Scarecrow Village. All jokes aside, this place is strange. First thing I was greeted by was an old elementary school, with someone who I guess is the principal sitting under a tent. The whole area is apparently filled with these scarecrows, and I don't know who made them or why. The more I walked around, the more scarecrows I stumbled across. Several of the scarecrows had plastic bags over their heads, which I assume is to protect them from the rain, but it just makes it all so much more eerie. Every single step I took into this place got more and more strange. Luckily, I'm really into stuff that's creepy without intending to be. I refuse to look deeper into this place because I kind of like the mystery of it all. I don't know who made these or why, but if you guys find something cool, let me know. I imagine this place was created to simulate a daily life that's long forgotten. A place that used to be bustling with families and had a strong community, but like so much of Japan's countryside, now sits hardly touched as people move into the big cities at an alarming rate. This is actually a true phenomenon, look it up. As creepy as it is, there's some tranquility here. In fact, I think I'm just going to be quiet so you can fully immerse yourself in the ambiance. But not before making a joke about how this scene depicts a grandpa sitting behind a trinitron trying to get his family to play melee when all they want to do is play Smash Ultimate. Come on guys, it's a better game, you know it is. I'm going to go grab an Aquarius, I'll be right back. I forgot to turn off the music, guys. I'm sorry. Oh my god. That was probably really scary. I'm sorry. How was it? Did you have fun? Well, it was finally time to head back to the butt. This statue looks like an important person, but I'm all historyed out today, so we're just gonna call her Wave Lady. She makes the waves go in and out, and she was a head developer on Wave Race Blue Storm. Yeah, sure, that works. It was finally time to leave the island, but I had fun. Surprisingly, I had a lot more fun learning about history than I did food this time. Maybe I should change the channel name from Japan Eat to Japan Learning About Various Things. Yeah, that's got a nice ring to it. I went around the deck to say goodbye to Amaksa Island. I tried to think of a Ralph Emerson quote, but nothing came to mind. I sat down in the chilies and started writing the script. Little did I know that I wouldn't finish it until now, in November, when it's cold. Not really a topical video now, is it? I want to take the time out personally to thank you all again for 1 million subscribers. Without the support of all of you, I'd just be sitting here making dumb jokes for my mom to watch. So you mean the world to me. More long form content more often is a focus point for the channel going forward. So if you aren't subscribed, you should consider it so we can go on more journeys together. See you next time.